Welcome to Tanak Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live from Kingsland, Texas, USA, with another episode of Rabbi Toby Singer's Let's Get Biblical Q and A, coming to you from the Holy Land, Rabbi Tovia, the man singer. Welcome back, Rabbi. How are you today? Wow. Great. Great. It's great to, great to be back here with you. Um, always exciting. Always exciting oh. to have... Come again? Tell me, tell me why it's so exciting. <laughs> you need, we need, we need to go here because everybody knows that you're the, the savior of the Jewish people, and so it's such an honor to be in your presence. That's, and the, the leader of the free world. That's what. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that part. Yeah, dang it. I got to memorize that. Interesting. Wow. We all keeping your thoughts. I've been I've been sick the last couple of days, so fortunately you can't catch anything through this guy. So um, I'll try to be quicker to the knob than I am to cough. I'll, I'll try to make sure I don't spoil your brains through all that stuff. So, uh, but anyway, welcome. Uh, glad to have you back and looking forward to uh, today's yeah. show. Um, let me make sure we're still, everything's keyed in. Yep, everybody's tuned in on YouTube. Very nice. Be sure to hit that like button and share the video. More importantly, subscribe to the YouTube channel and turn on all of the notifications. There's options, so make sure you click that all button. That'd be great. Okay. I'm not sure you can't transmit and you may want to wear a mask because I know some people think that you can't transmit anything over um, over through a microphone. But who could be sure? Who could be sure? Maybe, maybe I should just be really careful and maybe just that. wear a mask anyway. <laughs> That's funny. It's going to feel like you go flying right through the mic, jump right in today <laughs> with high speed internet. It's not like the old days we did violin. Now it's high speed, fancy thing. The thing that virus. How much does it take? Goes that is right crazy. Uh, I remember right. them at one point talking about smell o vision, making smell o vision. I don't know if that was a real thing or not, but I tell you what, it wouldn't surprise me if it was right down that same alley. I don't even know. There you go. Yeah, that's awesome. Cool deal. Okay, well we'll get right on into this bad boy, and uh, let's let's take let's take our first our first call. Caller, you're, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name what, uh, and where you're calling from. Shalom, William and Rabbi Singer. This is Rachel from Pennsylvania. Um, I have a question about this so-called end-time epic battle that everybody's waiting to see, all of the chariots and angels flying out of the sky to have a war with Satan. So I'm noticing that in Ezekiel 28, verse 16, Isaiah 14 and 12, and in the book of Revelations 12, 7 through 9, is where they're getting this big, um, you know, build up to create this character for this war for the end times of Satan and uh, the most high creator of the universe. So I was wondering if you could, Rabbi Singer, please explain what Ezekiel 28 really is about, Isaiah 14 really is about, Shalom, and uh, I appreciate all that you guys do, and have a blessed day. Excellent. Very good. <laughs> the War of Armageddon. Crazy stuff. Let's see what it is. I'm actually kind of excited about it myself. Good lesson for today. God hates arrogance. It's really that simple. In fact, um, those of you who attended my lecture in Jerusalem last week on Isaiah chapter 10, we spent a lot of time on that because the prophets detested haughtiness. And in particular, the haughtiness of not only our enemies, but our friends as well. And that's what comes into view in Isaiah chapter 14 and in Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay, let's explore those together. Let's first tell, talk about this war of Armageddon. There is no such thing. <laughs> so the war of Armageddon comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 16, verse 16. And it's based on a complete misreading of Zechariah chapter 12. Let's lay this all out. We are told in Scripture explicitly that at the end of days, 
nations will go to war against Israel over Jerusalem. It's really that simple. You'll find that, for example, in Zechariah chapter 8, huge chapter 12, and it stretches all the way to the very end of the book of Zechariah, meaning Zechariah chapter 14. It is famously in Ezekiel chapter 38 and chapter 39. All these chapters work together in symphony, and there are many others, but these are the most famous. Now, nations will want to attack the Jewish people who have returned to the land of Israel before the Messiah comes. It's very important to get this all lined up, and then we can talk about how every all the Christians get themselves into trouble with Isaiah 14. The Jewish people return to the land of Israel before the Messiah comes. Nations then attack Israel, attack Jerusalem, and it was a, it's an ill-advised adventure. They'll all be destroyed. Jerusalem will be a heavy, burdensome stone to all the nations who come up against it. Zechariah chapter 12. God will strengthen the weakest of the Jewish people. They will be like David, even like the angel of the Lord of hosts. They will defeat their enemies. Now, in the midst of that battle, battle, there will be a person killed in war, and that will cause the nation to weep, to mourn over him. And the, the Navi says, the prophet Zechariah says, that the mourning over him will be like what happened in the valley of Megiddo. Now, Zechariah is referring back to the last of the great Davidic kings, Yoshiahu Josiah. Josiah got killed in the valley of Megiddo when he went to war with Egypt. I don't want to get into that right now, but just so you know, Josiah, Yeshiahu, he was really a tzaddik, a contemporary of Jeremiah. It means the, really the end, toward the end of the first Israel period. He's a very great tzaddik. Unfortunately, he, he was a young man. He was not even 40 years old. He went to war against Egypt because Egypt wanted to pass through the land of Israel. Yeshiahu would not hear of it. He, Josiah would not allow any weapons to pass through, and he defends the land against Egypt. There were archers who didn't even know who Josiah was. Josiah was dressed as an ordinary soldier. Imagine that. A king fights with his people, dresses up like an ordinary soldier. He's a remarkable man. Unfortunately, a, an Egyptian archer shot him, killed him, and he was taken away. It was terrible. When the nation got wind that their beloved king died so young, so tragic, they mourned for him. They mourned terribly for him. And it triggered a repentance. That's the key. So what Zechariah chapter 12 is telling us, and this is a device that prophets use very frequently, is if you want to know what this future event is going to be like, meaning in the midst of a battle between the Jews and somebody great gets killed and that triggers mourning, you remember what happened to in the Valley of Megiddo. Whoever wrote the book of Revelation misconstrues this all and calls it the War of Armageddon. Based on that, it's a complete, complete misreading. Moreover, there is no such thing as an antichrist all made up and there is such a thing as satan and thankfully satan appears in tanakh very infrequently i'm going to say that one more time it is very rare for tanakh to make any mention of satan now why do i say thankfully it's not for the reason you think i'm grateful that satan doesn't appear much in tanakh this is a little counterintuitive because it makes it easy for us to know who he is, who is this Satan character. So Sutton does whatever God wants him to do. He is an angel that has no free will. He does whatever God wants. His job, his mandate, is to seduce people away from God and then to accuse them. That's it. 
That's what he's created for. He has no free will. Angels cannot go to war against God. That's not possible. Now, that is very possible in the pagan world. Very possible. It's very possible in the dualistic Zoroastrian world. It is a scenario that appears in all the all the dualistic world, and you can understand why. In the ancient world, what did they know? People didn't understand disease. They didn't understand misery. They couldn't explain why people died. Imagine, people died of whatever. They had no idea. Suddenly, a, a, a young woman is appears healthy. Her whole future is ahead of her. And suddenly, she just dies within months. They didn't know. They didn't understand what can't. They didn't understand any of these things. So it appeared to the ancient world that there's certainly a a benevolent God, a benevolent power, and a malnevolent power. This is the hallmark of dualism. One other angle to this, one other aspect of this, and this is the same stuff that fuels Paul, that uh, fuels Manichaeism, Gnosticism, is the same Avedizara, same idolatry in all of them. That the per, the 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 God, the deity that created this world is basically, he's sort of a dark fellow. He's the Lord of this world. He is a malnevolent deity. And the Gnostics, in fact, thought that it was the Jewish God that was malnevolent who created this world. And because, and, and again, it's not that they were bad people. I mean, think about living in the ancient world. People got sick for inexplicable reasons. I mean, if modern medicine did not exist, would you be alive today? So the world around them was broken, broken bodies and broken wheels. Above, they looked at the stars and they saw utter perfection. So they believed that certainly there were all sorts of powers in charge and the God of the heavens, of the stars, that was the good deity. So let's get back to our case right now. In the ancient world, this dualism, of course, would not touch Judaism unless someone went astray. Satan is in the Bible rarely, but his purpose is to only seduce men. Why? Because man has to have free will. Without free will, virtue is impossible, is unattainable. But we are told in Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, that although sin lies by the door and you are the object of his desire, you can master over him. Why? Because you've been given that power. Listen carefully. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the one who is in view is who appears in verse 1 and 2. It's Hiram, the king of Tyre. I implore you, when you have a question about the Bible, Look it up. Just look it up for yourself. But I grant you that if you look up a passage in a book like Ezekiel or Isaiah, and it's out of context, you'll have no clue what's going on because these prophets very frequently, most of the time, are using imagery to describe something very simple. So if it's out of context, all the trouble in the world. Hiram, a king who was a benevolent friend of the state of Israel in the ancient world, best friends, a financial giant, think of it very carefully, a financial giant mercantile and supplied Israel with the best woods from Lebanon, supplies for building the temple. But the king of Tyre became arrogant, demanded cities in the land of Israel. And cities that were offered to him were just not good enough for him. He had all the potential in the world, and he destroyed it. And as Ezekiel 28 opens up, it says, you thought you were an angel, you're just a man. That's how it actually begins. So I, I plead with people to look it up for themselves. 
Isaiah chapter 14 is a, a portent, a prophecy of doom for Babylon. Isaiah was writing 20, roughly 2,700 years ago. More germane, Isaiah was speaking, preaching during the Assyrian Empire. And he was looking into the future to the Babylonian Empire, which didn't exist yet. It would be like someone 200 years ago speaking about the Soviet Union. Isaiah describes the fall of the king of Babylon. Please read Isaiah chapter 14, but in context. So if you go to Isaiah 14 verse 4 as an example, you'll see it's speaking about the fall of Babylon, not Satan. Satan is not mentioned anywhere in these texts, nowhere. Christians have to come up with this stuff and interpolate it. See Babylon mentioned again in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 22. So what's going on in this one passage in, in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, where the King James actually renders, Ech no falta mishomayim helel ben shachar. Look how you have fallen from heaven and in the King James, it'll say Lucifer. It doesn't say Lucifer. It's all nonsense. The Christian Bible is just, the King James wasn't the first to do this. King James just put the word Lucifer in there, which is a, a reference to Satan. Lucifer really is the planet Venus, because it's the word Lucifer. Where does that come from? It's, Lucifer is never mentioned in any Bible. It's not mentioned in the Tanakh and the Hebrew Bible, and Lucifer is not even mentioned in the Christian Bible. Never, never mentioned. What, what the heck is Lucifer? How did that name for the planet Venus came to come to be the name for Satan? So it's not in the text. And I say to you this, my friends, you know, if you, if you didn't love God, if you didn't love Hashem, you wouldn't be watching the show. You have to, why are you watching this? Because you want to see my blue shirt. You don't need that. You have other things to do with your life. If you're watching this broadcast, that means you love Hashem very much and you understand, you want to understand his word. Isn't that marvelous? You have the creator of the heavens and the earth giving you a message. Wouldn't you want to read it in the words it was given? I read it through translations. You're reading the Bible with the, using a translation is like kissing God through a towel. You lose everything. What's Halil Ben Shachar? That means the morning star. What does that mean? Why is this a image of Bavel, of the Babylonian king? Listen very carefully. Today, we live in a time when the art of understanding the stars has been lost. Most people look up at the sky at night and they see nothing. Why? Because we live in cities for the most part. So there's so much light pollution, we can't see anything anyway. But even if we could, we don't need the stars any longer. Why? We, if you want to know what time it is, you want to know what direction you're going in, we have all sorts of instruments. We have clocks, watches, Cell phones, compasses is fairly old technology. We have it all. We don't, there's, we don't need that. But in the ancient world, that's what they had. A, a clock, a watch, that's a relatively modern innovation. Now, if, if it's daylight right now and you look up at the sky, why don't you see the stars? Why don't you see the moon? The reason it's not, is not because it's not there. It really is there. But you can't see it. Why? Because of the sun, because there's just too much light. At night, you could see the stars and other heavenly bodies only because it's dark enough to see it. The sun is out of the way, and then the sky is dark, and then you could see all the heavenly bodies. What is the brightest Heaven, celestial body in the heavens, it's the planet of Venus. Therefore, listen very carefully, Kendall. The planet of Venus 
because it's the brightest celestial body, as the morning approaches, the planet Venus is the last celestial body to be visible. So as the morning is coming, right, so all the stars begin to disappear, which they're there, but our ability to see them is lost. The last celestial body that's still visible is the planet of Venus, and hence is the brilliant metaphor of Isaiah. The kings of Babylon, they were very proud. Could you imagine? You know what the Babylonian Empire was? The Assyrian Empire was mind-blowing. The Assyrian Empire, there was nothing like it prior to it. The, the Babylonian Empire? Do you know what that was? you know what that meant? The Babylonian Empire in its time, people thought it would never disappear. It could never be destroyed. Look how powerful, look how strong. Nebuchadnezzar? Do you know what that meant, the Babylonian Empire? And that's how the empire portrayed itself as eternal. So Isaiah compares the Babylonian king, the empire, to the planet Venus. The planet Venus, in a sense, the Halal ben Shachar, in a sense, it, the morning star is arrogant. It's not really arrogant. It's, it's gorgeous use of language. The planet Venus, in a sense, goes, look at me. I know the sun is coming up. I know it's sunrise, but I'm still here and I'm never going away. But it happens a few minutes later. The sun continues to rise from our perspective. And then Venus disappears, gone. That's it. That's where the word Lucifer, as in lucent, comes from. So Isaiah chapter 14 is talking about Bavel, about the fall of Babylon. There's no mention of Satan. The idea of, I know someone's going to ask me about Armelius. Don't ask me about these things. It's silly. That at the end of days, there will be, a, will be nations that will go to war against the children of Israel, against Jerusalem. They'll be destroyed. They are not the Antichrist. The Antichrist means, that's found, the Antichrist is found explicitly by name in the Epistle of John, in the Epistles of, in the Epistles of John, in Revelation, in Second Thessalonians, it's there. The Antichrist is a pretender to be a Messiah. All that's nonsense. Is an Antichrist, meaning an anti-Messiah figure who most Christians believe will emerge, and then the, then the Jews will worship him, and it turns out he's really Satan. This is all nonsense. When Mashiach comes, everyone will know there's no anti-Messiah. Armelius, I know, only because I know someone's going to come up with this, Armelius is an unambiguous reference to Romulus. Who's Romulus? He's the mythical founder of Rome. That's all it is. Rome is the last empire of the four empires that subjugated the Jewish people. Edom, Rome, is the worst of all. And Edom is going to be destroyed. We have entire books in Tanakh devoted to the destruction of Edom. It's finished. It's gone. No more. And that's where. So there will be nations. Hopefully much of this has happened already. Meaning that nations have come up against Yerushalayim. The Jews are here. God has strengthened the Jewish people. Ezekiel chapter 28 is about Hiram. The key is that both Bovel and Hiram, two very different types of figures, one of them an enemy, one of them an ally, but both become arrogant and God destroys, destroys them all. And Mashiach then comes and please God, we will see the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimheda Biomenu. Thank you for that thoughtful question. Indeed. So, so many new things that were made up. I guess when you're creating stories, you might as well just keep on going with it because there's a lot of things that are floating around out there that just don't make any sense, just like the ones you just discussed. Hey. By the way, during that thing, I kind of heard you in my earphones. I don't know if you know. Gotcha. It may be because I can only, there's a little bit of leak that comes through. So if you can tolerate that, I don't think it came through the channel. If you could just tune that out. Yeah, it's all good. Okay. It's okay. Good. good deal. All right. Very nice. All right. Caller, you are live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. And of course we have a call. Uh, hey there, guys. This is uh, the Rev. Robbins over here in uh, Alabama this week visiting relatives. Um, Welcome back. Uh, two quick questions for the rabbi. Um, so, uh, as a when I was a, when I was a Christian, 
Um, I used to pray, and I, I used to think that I hear that I would hear God talking to me. And now, as a Noahide, um, I'm I pray, and I'm not sure if God's talking to me or not. Like, how can I tell um, if God's talking to me? And does God talk to the Christians? Um, and my my second question was, um, in the Tanakh, it talks about how Moses, when he saw God, he uh, his hair had turned um, white and he was glowing, and uh, Whenever Paul had his Damascus Road experience, uh, it, it says nothing about his uh, appearance changing, and he supposedly uh, met the the Jesus God mm. face to face. Um, so, I mean, if you could just explain like how how that's how that's possible, and um, and then the uh, the prayer that's question cool. um, and God talking to me, I really appreciate it. And okay, Rev, go ahead and hang up now. Support to you, Rabbi. Uh, we'll 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 Thank see you, how sir. if he goes through this one pretty quickly. Uh, we we could try to get both of them. Uh, and, but I will not address the first question. Okay, okay, very good. So uh, go ahead and tune up now, or hang up now and tune in for your for your answer. Thank you. All right, Rabbi, go ahead. I'm probably going back. I don't know, twenty five, thirty years. A young man who got caught up in an Eastern cult called Hare Krishna. They're not that big now in the United States, but 30 years ago, it was the thing. You'd see them in airports with shaved heads, with a ponytail, and um, hitting tambourines, collecting money. Don't ask me. A Jewish fellow got caught up in this group. And Baruch Hashem, we studied together, and he did tshuva. He was involved in the Hare Krishna group, I think it was in California. And thank God he repented. He returned back to the God of Israel. And he went off to, to Jerusalem to study. He went off to a very well-known yeshiva in Jerusalem, study and when I visited Israel we got together and he was very excited he's learning Torah he returned back to his creator and he said to me rabbi I have a question it's bothering me a little bit I believe in everything but something is bothering me a little bit I said what is it he said you know when I spent those years in in Hare Krishna I lived in a, a commune, and it was so ecstatic. We, I used to get up at something like 4.30 or 5 o'clock in the morning. It was still dark outside, and I would jump out of bed with excitement. My job was to wash, to anoint the statues, these Hindu statues that they had in the temple. And I did this, Rabbi, with so much excitement. I was so excited that I could partake of anointing these statues in preparation for the prayers. Um, I studied Torah, and here I am in Yerushalayim. And of course, now as a Jew, we get up in the morning to pray the Shacharit, the morning prayer. And frankly, he said, sometimes it's a little hard to drag myself out of bed. <laughs> he said, asked me why when I was, Hare Krishna is kind of a Hindu sect, and it's not like Hinduism in India. It's like, a, it was kind of like a culty group in the United States. He asked me the obvious question. Says, when I was a Hare Krishna, I got out of bed. There wasn't. I was so happy. I, I, my heart was pounding with joy to work, to prepare these statues for the morning worship, to anoint them. Don't ask me. And now it's a little challenging getting out of bed to go for my morning prayers. What's going on? So I told them, you know, when you were in Hare Krishna, what did you eat Sahara? What did the evil inclination tell you? Get up. <laughs> Go worship these statues. 
That's what people do. You know, people are so excited they're going to go to Vegas. Ah, they have no trouble making the flight to Las Vegas. For Las Vegas, it's not a problem at all. I'll get it up. But if you have to take a flight to go somewhere to study Torah, ah, it's not so fast. I said, your, your Yetzirah, your evil inclination when you were a Hindu, said, get up. Go worship idols. Go, go do this. And you did it with such excitement and such in such haste. But now, now that you worship the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, so what is your Yetzhara, which means the evil inclination? It's it's the sudden, it's the it's the angel that tries to seduce you into turning your back on God. It casts forth its blandishments. Is that your free will? Why? How do you know? It says so. Where? Deuteronomy 30, 14, 15, all the way through 19. Before you, I place life and death, good and evil. Choose life. Isaiah 45, verse 7. God created good, created evil. It's all in the Bible. Well, if there was no evil inclination, there'd be no virtue. Virtue would be impossible. What good is it if you're born of a virgin and you're God that you didn't sin? It, it does, it's silly. So here, here's the point. So in, in a person is in any form of idolatry, of course your evil inclination is going, go! You know, a person who's, I don't know, going off to a bar, I don't know, going off to Las Vegas or going off to some other place where you know what goes on, right? So how hard is it for that person to muster, to find, to seize the excitement, the energy? Sam, we're going to the plane. We're going to go to the thing. And the moment we get into Las Vegas, we're going right to the crap table. And he's just so happy, full of joy. <laughs> right? That's what happens. A person is very excited about. So it's very simple what's going on here. On the other hand, if it's going to pray... It might not as be exciting as going to who knows Bermuda to a beach where people forget to get dressed. It's all, it's all, it's all very simple. Another point must be made, or I'd be robbing you of vital information. Although Christianity presents itself as a religion of the Bible, and in particular the Protestant iteration of Christianity says sola scriptura the Bible alone second Timothy chapter 3 verse 15 16 is scripture alone in reality it's not see in Protestant Christianity whether you're a Southern Baptist or a an assemblies of God but even more so in an assemblies of God type of denomination which means a charismatic denomination. That's a capital C. That means a, a Pentecost. That means where people are speaking in tongues and there's the, the, the sp- people get have th- this Holy Spirit working in them where they can speak in tongues and so on. It's so a part of the culture of, of Pentecostal Christianity that God is speaking through you that people really believe it. People in Pentecostal, Protestant Christianity in particular, and I'm talking about the fundamentalist evangelical iteration. When I say fundamentalist, I do not mean that as a pejorative. I just mean people, there is a a way of that truth is taught through the Lord spoke to me, the Lord laid it on my heart. This is wrong. Whenever you hear a religion of any religion that claims you know the truth because the Lord revealed it to me, go ask the Lord what the truth is. You know to run, run for your life. It cannot be. The only way we know the truth is from Scripture, from Tanakh, nothing else. That's why it's called a canon. A canon is what all all truth could be measured by, not personal revelations. Why do you need personal revelation? You have Tanakh. Now, we plead with, what are we asking for God when we when we plead, when we entreat the Almighty, you bequeath, you give wisdom. Of course, we ask Hashem for wisdom so we can understand His Torah. We don't look for doctrine. 
because the Lord laid it on my heart? Because what happens is people lay it on their heart, whatever they want to believe. And then if you happen to be in 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 India or in Bali, so the the monkey god, Hanuman, lays it on your heart. If you happen to be in Sao Paulo, in Rio, in the Philippines, so the Virgin Mary and all the saints lay it on their heart. Why? The Virgin Mary can't get to Saudi Arabia, she can't get a passport, she can't get a visa. Why is it that people all over the world, what is laid on their heart and all their vision is dependent all on geography? The answer is because they're very predisposed to this. They're, if you're in, in South America, because Brazil is the largest Roman Catholic country in the world, I've been there. There's idols everywhere. So the Mariology and the worshiping the saints and the lightning, it's everywhere. It stinks. It reeks of it. If you're from Brazil, don't be angry at me. But it's, it's everywhere. And as a result of that, people there think all the saints speak to them. How come the saints that are found in, in Brazil don't talk, doesn't, don't talk to anyone in Bali? They, they can't get there? The answer is people engage in a, a biased confirmation. If it affirms their religious beliefs, then the feeling they get, aha, I'll go with it. I mean, why don't Protestants have the Virgin Mary coming to them? Why don't um, Southern Baptists you know, have the saints that talk to people in Mexico? The answer is it's all, it's all silliness. People in that world, world because this is what the, oh, the Lord laid it on my, I mean, people talk this way in the church. People literally say, the Lord, laid, would you ask the Lord, what asking the Lord? What are you talking about? And if I will go ask the Lord and, and, and Hare Krishna walks into the room, what am I supposed to do? Move to India? What are you, crazy? And this is what happens when you talk to Christians. And you Christians, or former Christians, no, I ain't making this up. This is by and large, Christians are good people, but this is the shell game that goes on. Christians will tell you, buddy, listen up. There are 365 prophecies in your Old Testament that prove that Jesus is the Messiah. So you respond, really? This is a fantastic claim. Please tell me. Tell me what the best prophecy is. I want to hear it, right? So they start telling you this, and it's all silly, empty. You know, 365 times zero is zero. All heavenly, right? It's all shaker. It's all silliness. It's empty. It's all fake. It's each one's the ones. That's so when they finally get tired of all their verses, because they're making this big truth claim, it's a big truth claim. The Christians are claiming that the Jewish Bible prophesied about Jesus. Now, the last book of the Hebrew Bible is the book of Mal Malachi, right? Malachi is 500 years before Christianity. That would be a very impressive thing if somebody in the Jewish Bible prophesied about Christianity. Isaiah lived 700 years before Christianity, as did Hosea, as did Micha, as did Amos. That would be a very impressive thing. And this is what always happens. That you talk to, try it. You talk to a Christian, and they start telling you about these verses. And then you go, let me show you what goes on immediately they switch like a shell game. And they say, why don't you pray? Did you ever ask the Lord if Yeshua is the Messiah? What happened? Like, what, what happened there? Like, we went from, oh, this is, we can prove this to you. We have objective empirical evidence. It's right there in your Old Testament. And then we take their fake translations and they're corrupt. And it's not there. It's not only not there, it's scandalous. I'm telling you now, in each and every time, they're going to start telling you that the Lord spoke to me. Why do I care the Lord spoke to you? The Lord speaks to people all over the place. In Bangkok, the Lord, Buddhist talks to everybody. It's so silly. Why do you need a Bible for? Who needs Tanakh? It means if we are access, accessing doctrinal truth through personal revelation, then what do you need a Bible for? Mm -hmm. I mean, all you need then just take a book of Genesis. So you need the book of Genesis because you want to know about the history of mankind. But you can throw the you don't need Tanakh. Why do you need scripture? Scripture is why do you need a canon? The whole point of Tanakh, of scripture and a canon is that 
only that is what is used and not your personal experience. The only thing we do plead is that we plead for wisdom, for understanding, for mercy, for sure. But never doctrine or else people in all the world, they'll pray for this and they'll get whatever they want. And that's why the Catholics don't believe in what the Protestants do. And the Protestants don't believe in what the Catholics do. Everyone except. So, my friend, it's all silly. The reason why now you're having a little trouble, I'll tell you this last thing. You did shuva. You repented of Christianity. But, you know, sometimes an ex-smoker, even though he doesn't smoke anymore, when he walks down the street and someone else is smoking and he walks through the 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 a bill of smoke. Hmm, I remember that. Likes the smell. It's what that is is a relic of a of a of a past. This is why Isaiah, the prophet says, wash yourself touching touch, touch nothing unclean. And truth is, I'll tell you, brother, straight away, you have to ask God to cleanse you of this so that the old mindset is God. Say, Lord, oh, would you heal me of this? Because there is still a tobacco smell in the old clothing. You don't pray for doctrine. You look in Tanakh for doctrine and truth. You don't pray for personal prophecy. You don't do anything. How do you do that? What you do is you say, wisdom, wisdom is the first thing we ask for. We ask for uh, mercy, we ask for the redemption, but never doctrine. You want to know what you're supposed to believe? Only Tanakh. I love you, whoever you are. Thank you so much for your thoughtful question. Good, very good, cool. Uh, you know, I was thinking about something uh, when you said all that. Um, when if somebody if somebody calls on the phone to your house, right, and they say I'm with so and so, and then they finally show up at your house. Um, you just don't let them in. You want to make sure they have an ID with them, something that identifies them with who they, what the voice actually said. And so for me, it was like when I was when I would hear things like, it, it, mine was internal voices that I would hear, um, like like that movement, that really heavy pull of your heart. But some people say they actually hear an external voice, you know, like like when Moses, when when Hashem spoke to Moses face to face, sort of thing. They say they experience that now. And so my thought is. If any, if any voice you hear, no matter what it is, you need to check the ID. And for us, right, you have to say that the ID is what the Torah says. So if, if whatever voice right. is teaching you against Torah, then it's, it's a false, it's, an, it's a, an imposter of some kind. So, I'll just put this in. The Torah is not as sardonic as I am. The Torah tells us very explicitly that false religions will produce numinous ecstatic experiences. The Torah says don't listen to it. False prophets will be able to do miracles. Parshas Re, Deuteronomy 13. Torah is very clear, incidentally, that false religions can produce miraculous experiences. Right. I describe it as I, I, I'm i not impressed. But that's because we're today. I'm not wanting to get complicated. But the Torah doesn't make a difference. It could be, see, a, a guy could do all kinds of miracles. If he tells you, follow God, your fathers didn't know. Don't keep the Torah. Do not be deceived by that prophet. I'm only testing to see if you love me. Right. Great. That's Thank beautiful. you. Beautiful. Okay. Moving on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Hello, uh, Rabbi Singer. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Um, I had a question regarding... Um, I'm in the process of conversion to Judaism right now, and I've been a no-hide for the last five years. And I had a family who were Messianics, and I removed them completely, trying to tell them that their false Mashiach is not God, because in Numbers 23, it says that God is not a human being. We see this in 1 Samuel, we see it in Hosea. So it's odd that Christians believe that, and then two, they seem to have this ideology that they have to convert the Jewish people to, Christian, to Christianity for their false Mashiach to return. And that they have this whole new world and everything, and the Jewish theology is to preserve the current world. So my question is, why is it that the New Testament is completely just, uh, just totally different than the Torah when you actually start studying hmm. and seeing the truth and why do Christians believe the way that they believe? Stay with me, sweetheart. Stay with me. You're begging the question. You understand that, right? Are you yes. still there? I mean, you're 
Bay, you, the question is, let's say you, you have a signature that you use, right? Whenever you sign a document, you sign a check, right? I've never met you, I presume. I surely don't know what your signature looks like, right? And if I walked into a lending and search to your bank and I signed your name, what would the signature will look completely different than your signature. And they would go, sorry, it doesn't match. I pre you have a cell phone, don't you? Yes? Yes. All right. Do you use a PIN code? Do you use a biometrics? What security system does it use? I use a PIN code. PIN code. So imagine you hand me your cell phone, and I wonder why doesn't your cell phone open when I make up a PIN code? The answer is that it's, a it's the wrong PIN code. Some people have biometrics. It just looks at the face and then recognizes. Well, the reason is very simple. Tanakh has very clear instructions. It was not written for geniuses or high IQ peoples and scholars. Anybody can read it. So easy. So obviously, every false religion has a false Bible, and it doesn't match, and the pin code doesn't match. Sweetheart, it's just so simple, so posh, so clear. You have to, only thing is that a person has to know the original pin code. You have to have the markers of the original fingerprint. You have to have the markers of the original Torah. And you said delicious, delicious. First Samuel chapter 15, verse 29. The goy of Israel doesn't lie because he's not a man that will change his mind. It's very simple. So the, the, the church has changed it completely. And that's why the Christian Bible does not match. It's not a different orientation, my friends. It's utterly different. It's completely different. You understand? With, and, and just, so you, you understand what I'm saying. That's what I say to people. Any claim that you encounter, you have to check it to make sure the pin code matches. I mean, look, if you do that just to protect the integrity of your cell phone, so what is it, a phone? As you can send messages, I mean, how important is that? And you still guard your cell phone security that not anyone can go into it. And that's a, what does it have, really? Who you spoke to, who you text message, I don't know, what what could it have on it? This is your relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. At least, at least treat God and protect your relationship with God, at least the standard of your cell phone, Right? I mean, if you protect the integrity of your cell phone with pin codes, with biometric recognition, Allah has come vakama, how much more would you protect your relationship with Hashem? Nice. Thank you so much for calling in. Appreciate your call. Thank you. Thank Larry. you, Thank you, sweetheart. I just want to say that. Protect your relationship with Hashem, the Torah, with at least the integrity, with at least the standard you protect your cell phone. Does that make sense? And people don't. You know, people rely on King on King James translations. Finished. Still got hacking, ransomware. It's not even it's a joke what you guys are doing. I'm telling you, can look. Listen up. You're relying on English translations and you permit your child of Hashem and you permit yourself not to speak and read Hebrew. You you have no security system in place. You log on to your computer and you have some sort of password or use a fingerprint. That you're so careful. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to eternal relation with Hashem, sure, I'll rely on a translation assembled by 47 men from the Church of England that rendered, they claim they rendered the original Hebrew and Greek into the English language between 1607 and 1611. Really? Really? Think. Think, use your head. Use your head. And this is a big problem. People somehow, I trust a guy who was 400 years ago, but they put all kinds of ransom, they put all kinds of security on their phone. Please, this is silly. And why do Christians say that, that Jesus can't make a second coming until the Jews first believe in Jesus convert to Christianity? Because of Matthew 23, verse 39. We're, we're told that Jesus says, I will not return unless you say, Blesses he that comes in the name of the Lord. Didn't happen. Why? Because it's all silliness. Anyways, thank you so much for your thoughtful questions. Very good. All right. Thank we'll go ahead and move on to the next caller. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name where you're calling from. Okay. 
Give him a second. Kelly, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where you calling from? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's okay. Uh, my name is Ambrosio. My name is Ambrosio Ledesma. Very good. Welcome. Yeah, could you hear me? I can. Go right ahead. Yes, sir. I hear you. Yeah, go, go ahead. Good, good. Um, now, um, something really strange happened to me. You know, I uh, in 2019... You know, I uh, got on my knees for the first time and I asked God for forgiveness and completely just broke down, you know, um, and I I asked to be filled with, you know, the Holy Spirit or whatnot and to be used by him for his will in the world to make, you know, with the kids growing up nowadays, if I could be used, you know what I mean? Just motivation, sure. you know, and um after that, I had three dreams. I had a dream where I was standing in line, and it was nothing but pure, bright, white light. Like, and I was just seeing just the back ends of people. And I stepped out of line to look down further because I seen just bright white light shining way far off. And as soon as I stepped back in line, I woke up and... I was told in a way I was either being in line for judgment or to be used. And so a few, about a month later, um, went by and I had another dream. I had these three pure, pure, pure bright white light angel came down and touched me. And it happened three times in a row. I woke straight up, straight up, sat straight up. And then I laid back down, and when I laid back down, it happened again. And it was just a pre, just pure bright light. And it was three o'clock, it was about three o'clock in the morning. Just, then I had you would a, just tell me, like, what's your question to me? Well, then I had then I had a dream about Donald Trump. Real, real quickly, okay. pardon me. Let me interrupt you fast. So, do you have an actual? What's your actual question for the rabbi? Well, I was brought to the Book of Daniel after these dreams. I was brought to the Book of Daniel, and I've been getting these weird confirmations. You know, a guy named Daniel made me a sign that says the lions den. In the last two or three years, I've been just this weight has been constantly on me. I've been completely different. All I do is want to study. I've been just in the book. And then with the whole coronavirus thing, I was told to look up a certain name of a doctor, and his name meaning was Angel of Death. There was the death angel, sickle maker, reaper. And I'm just like, if this is, I'm getting confirmation on this. We're still, it, still trying to find out, still trying to find out what's your, this, what's your main yeah. question. If you could just sum this, everything up. If you could and, just actually. This is just a very spiritual a thing for me. And I just. One more question. Kelly, are you still with us? Do you want to get uh, back? I'm sorry. Please? Yeah, why don't you why don't you do me a favor? Why don't you send an email to Rabbi Tobia Singer at TobiaSinger1 at AOL.com and you can list out your full details there. And whenever he's got some spare time, he will definitely get with that. You can copy me on that too if you'd like. Uh Tanaktalk at gmail.com. Okay. So Tobia Singer1 at AOL.com. Okay, they're probably the best format to handle that question on. Thank you for your call. Okay, very good. Uh, Color, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Anthony. I'm calling from New Jersey, and I have a question for the Robbie. Go right ahead. Uh, brother, my question is about uh, the prophet Isaiah, chapter 2, verse 3. Is Isaiah talking about Moshiach or God himself? Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. Yes. Okay, is there, there must be claims about this with with possible 
a touch of the Jesus. Okay, go ahead and hang up now. We'll tune in for your answer. Thank you for your call. I, I have no, 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 no. Don't. Oh, I, don't hang up. I have no clue what he's asking about. Okay. It's, it's a gorgeous verse. Whoever you from New Jersey, I don't know what exit you're from. He just wants to know, know if it's if that's referring to God himself or the Messiah when he comes. That's his only question. Yes, the answer is when Mashiach comes, and many nations will come, and they will say, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And we will learn from his ways, and we will go in his path, for out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of Hashem from Jerusalem. I Don't you want to like do flips and go, ah, I love you, Hashem? That verse, by the way, didn't make it onto the Isaiah wall on 1st Avenue and 42nd Street. That verse they don't like so much. Another verse with the with the spears and, and swords into plowshares and pruning is there. But this verse, verse 3, this didn't make it. But yes, this is, um, this is all messianic. Those first five passages of Isaiah chapter 2 are all ecstatic. Some of the most famous passages in all of the Bible about the messianic age. Thank you very much for your thoughtful question. Okay, go ahead. Full nods are blowing up here, so that's good. Uh, just dealing with that as well. So, color your live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hello, can yeah, you hear me? I can. You are live on the air. Uh, what is your name? Where are you calling from? My name is David. I'm calling from Tennessee. Welcome, David. I have a question about Damascus. Uh, the destruction of Damascus is in the Bible. I hear a lot of Christians say that it has something to do with end times. I'm confused about it, and I'd like for the rabbi to explain that to me, please. Okay, very good. Go ahead and hang up now to me for your answer, okay? Thank you. Okay. So, that's a very good question, and I'm not sure which reference you're speaking of. I'll give you one insight to this, which is very important. Damascus, Aram, Syria, all the same thing. It emerges in Isaiah as an example, as an ally of the northern kingdom of Israel. They sought to destroy the Davidic dynasty in the days of Ahaz during the Assyrian Empire. Ahaz was a very wicked king, and both the king of the northern king of Israel, his name was Pekach ben Ramah Yahu, and the king of Damascus, his name was Ritzin. So Ritzin is destroyed, Damascus is destroyed, and you'll find this reference in Isaiah 7, 8, and other places. So it's not on face value, it's not messianic in that, it's describing the destruction of Damascus, and Ritzin incidentally is is killed in Second Kings, see chapter 15, 16, that region. He's killed. So the point is that the promise that Damascus will be destroyed. After all, Damascus tried to destroy the house of David. If Damascus would have succeeded in destroying the Davidic house, the whole promise that God made to King David would have been obliterated. Hashem couldn't allow that to happen. The king of Judah, Ahaz, was a very wicked king. He didn't deserve God. He didn't deserve God's salvation, but God had to deliver him because of the promise that he had made to King David, his great great grandfather. The point of Damascus in messianic terms, we have to go deep tight, high, listen carefully, is that the way that God delivered the, the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, from Damascus was in an, an unremarkable way and in, in a way that was not miraculous. That's what was very important. It was not miraculous. The Pekach Baramayahu 
Israel's king, the northern kingdom, and Syria, they're just summarily killed. Not interesting. Conversely, the way that the Assyrian Empire was destroyed was quite miraculous. That occurs during the days of Hezekiah. So what is conveyed to us about Damascus is Damascus is a picture of what happens to a nation that's an enemy of Israel. Uh, when I say Israel, I mean Judah. But the nation is really not worthy of being delivered. And that's what's meant. And therefore, if you want to get messianic hair, you want to get tight here on the Messiah. So the Mashiach can come, change that. The Mashiach will come when Israel repents, Isaiah 59, verse 20. But the question is, what will trigger that repentance? Will they turn to God because everything is falling apart? Or will they return to God out of love for God? See? So if they repent because they feel like they have no choice, so God will deliver them, but it, it will be kind of the way the kingdom Judah was delivered from Damascus. If the nation will turn to God out of love, and they won't need to be stimulated into repentance by oppression, so then it'll be like the deliverance from Assyria. And that's the messianic theme that pulses through Tanakh with regard to Damascus. Thank you very much for your question. All right, very good. We can move on to the next caller. One second. That's funny. Calls only come in whenever you and I are talking, so you hear that plink planks. <laughs> so bear with me one second. That'll be the mic. Hang on. Sorry about that. I had to cough for a minute. Okay. Uh, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Uh, is this me? Yep, you're live on the air. Go ahead with your questions. Uh, hi, Rabbi. Hi, William. My name is Steve. I'm calling from New Jersey. Welcome, Steve. And uh, my question is about uh, Paul. So when I read Paul, I see that his theology or Christology, he's relying on a really sharp binary opposition that he draws between the flesh and the spirit. Uh, the flesh being earthly and therefore corrupt or sinful, and the spiritual being heavenly and therefore perfect. Um, and my sense of Paul is that this is a guy who really hated the very flesh that he was composed of for whatever reason, and specifically I'm thinking of Romans 7. Um, Me too. And my, yeah, and my question is, um, could the reason why self also have something to do with why he was celibate um so you you, you clipped out on one, one where you said could the reason be did paul hate himself is that what you were saying well, he's yeah, or, very um, does does the reason why paul hated himself could that mm. possibly have to do with why he was also uh celibate got it he extolled celibacy as a virtue great so, that, that's my question okay super thank you for your call and go to hang up now to your answer thank you, you bet. all right really. <laughs> you look like you're holding back. <laughs> I've ever been asked on the show. This is really very insightful. Brilliant. It's very rare that I'm asked such a scholarly question. And I map that out as you were asking it. So Paul very much was agitated by his own flesh and you're very right he he saw in his flesh sin and that was uncontrollable and he feels that only through Jesus that he could be glorified because the flesh was the law of sin this comes through in Romans chapter 7 verse 25 Going back to 718 is very, very strong. For I know that in me, my flesh dwells no good thing. Romans 7 is extremely important because Paul there is addressing fellow Jews in Rome. 
The book of Romans is the last book that Paul wrote chronologically, and he's writing to a church that he has never, he's not yet visited. His recipients are Romans, Rome, but they're Jews and non-Jews, and Romans 7 stands out because Paul is speaking to Jews in that chapter, and he's encouraging them not to keep the Torah and explaining personally that his own flesh is what agitates him. You have to wonder about Paul of why was there this sense that anything that is physical and his flesh was sinful. The answer is really very straightforward. It's the same, it's the same urges that that agitated Augustine that he describes in his confessions. And Augustine had that same worldview as Paul did, that Manichaeus view, that dualistic view, that anything physical was sinful. Paul was bothered deeply by his flesh, by his urges of his flesh. And it is no doubt that is connected to the celibacy that he brags about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. There are people, many, who believe that Paul was struggling with his own sexuality, his own doubts about his sexuality. And whenever you hear about celibacy in a religious system, that is a red flag for dualism, that anything physical of the body is evil, every urge is evil, and therefore it has to be suppressed. These are completely connected. And if you notice in in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and what Romans and 1 Corinthians have in common is that these two letters, written at different times, but not that far apart, maybe five years apart, are indisputed letters of Paul. They are definitely from his hand. In 1 Corinthians 7, Paul urges virgins to remain so. To those who are married, he urges them. He says, if your passions are, it's better to be married than to burn. Now, I don't want to take him out of context. I mean, he does say that if you're married, that spouses should be loyal to each other, but he, marriage is just a, you know, if you marry, but he says it's, if you can, be as I am, be as I am, celibate. There's no doubt that Paul's obsession with sin related to his body and his sexual urges. Maybe his, maybe very likely the urges that punished Augustine, the same sex urges that he, it, that, that burned within him. And, I, and that's why in Romans chapter 7, Paul describes that when he encountered the law, this is what people don't pick up on. He says, until I knew about the law, it was fine. But when he came to know about the law, that's when he came to know about sin. Now, this is very striking because if Paul was who people, the church describes him as, someone who grew up in a Pharisaic home, and a completely religious, orthodox home, what we call orthodox, you don't suddenly come to know about the law. You're raised with that as a child. So this verse kind of gives away that Paul came from, if it was Tarsus, Tarsus was the the center of Greek reflection and theology and thinking in the ancient world. It's one of the great centers of it. At some point, when he comes to know about the Torah, he comes into contact with a chapter like Leviticus 18 and 22. That would overwhelm him. 
Paul was so agitated by this, but the those who held to dualistic views held that the physical and the spiritual were completely incompatible. And this bleeds through everything. It's his view of Jesus' resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, perhaps the most famous chapter of all Paul's writings, where he describes the resurrected spiritual body of Jesus, something quite different than his physical body, because the two of them are completely incompatible with each other. So Romans chapter 7 begins with a metaphor of a woman who's married to a man who's bound by the marital vow. But when her spouse dies, so she's no longer married, she's no longer bound by that marital vow. After all, her spouse died. That's his metaphor that he is writing, that he is using, that he's marshalling, that he's employing as he speaks to his brethren, meaning fellow Jews. He's urging them that they don't have to keep the Torah anymore. When I say the Torah or the law, I I am saying that his view was what's called antinomian, which means ritual law. Paul is not for murdering and robbing and sexual, none of that stuff. And he was very clear about that. We're talking about, about ritual law. And Paul then describes it personally how he came to be free of the law, which was a curse for him, and his flesh reminded him of the curse of the law, was a curse for him. And the only escape, the only escape from his wretched body, his wretched flesh, was Christ crucified, a term only used by Paul. It's a Pauline term thoroughly. So Paul was um, an emotionally broken person, a person obsessed with his own sin and inadequacy, very, very much like Augustine, very much. Augustine was more honest, meaning Augustine One of the things about this very striking Western church father, the most important of all, is how transparent he was about his life, what shaped his thinking, and the experiences that he that he went through his sexual journey and his same sex journey and all that he describes it all. He's quite transparent about it. Paul does not spell that out. Paul does spell out that he was very troubled. He encourages others, as you brilliantly assembled in 1 Corinthians 7, to be celibate. When someone tells you that celibacy is a virtue, don't walk, run. This is the commandment that Hashem gives in the beginning of the Torah. Be fruitful and multiply. Not celibate. Have children. Have kindlech have many, many children. Celibacy, the, the, the idea that celibacy should be virtuous, which is in the Catholic Church, I mean, the priests are supposedly celibate, that's all dualistic. The idea that the physical body, that's sinful. The celestial heavens, that's where godliness is, and they're not compatible. You know, in this week's Parsha that we just passed in Parsha's Vayetze, we encounter Jacob's dream, the most numinous of all. Jacob saw the heaven and earth connected by a ladder, angels going up and down, God at the very top, and his glory is moving up and down, right here in Israel. Jews, it means it's all connected. Have a relationship with your wife. Of course, enjoy the beautiful blessings of marriage together. Enjoy delicious food. Just make sure it's, the food belongs to you and not someone else. Make a blessing on it. Make sure it's kosher. As you eat it, celebrate with Hashem. After you, v'achalt v'savato v'rachlis Hashem l'kecha. Eat, be satisfied, bless the Lord your God. Tanakh, Judaism, is all about taking the physical and raising it up to the spiritual. It's a very physical, 
faith. The Torah is pregnant with taking the physical and raising it up to the heavens, connecting the two. Christianity is very much, very much a product of the Neoplatonic world, very much a product of the dualistic world. In that same in, uh, spiritual environment as the Zoroastrians and the Gnostics and the Manichaeus, and and that's where you know where the the think of Marcion came from, the Marcionite view, second century, the idea that the Jewish Bible was from the God of the Jews and the New Testament was the God of Paul and incompatible with physical bodies really bad and worthless and Jesus didn't really die but it only appeared so that's what the Gnostics so you whoever you are a, a very smart fellow um, I have very rarely heard a question not that all of you ask great questions but this was really very sharp connecting Romans 7 with 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 1 Corinthians 15. This is really the wiring under it all. This is really what's going on. You know, when you, you have a car, nice car, it looks beautiful, you get in, you start it, but then you take the top off, you see the engine, right? But then you take the engine apart, you see all the wiring. So you really ask about the, the wiring of what drives Paul what's happening like what's going on here like what's this guy talking about why is he bothered what's i mean this is why augustine even encouraged people who were married a lot of church fathers did that look if you're having children sleep together but once you have children you can have that's it no need to be together that's the that whole dualistic world it's completely antithetical to anything found tonight thank you so much for that very thoughtful insightful question So, okay, so, William? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I was actually taking a call. Uh, oh, it's all right. Lucas, I think, Lucas, uh, if you have one more, because the world is... Yeah, that's it. Like we are kind of running low on time, aren't we? Right, so like, it's almost 11.30 here. Okay, gotcha. So we'll take this last call. Is that okay? Sure. Okay, great. Okay, uh, caller, caller, you're live on the air. Please tell us your name. Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Philip calling from Los Angeles. Philip, welcome back. Hi, I have a follow-up question on a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, Rabbi said that in Genesis 25, 9, the fact that is, um, Isaac and Ishmael bury their father together indicates the future reconciliation between Judaism and Islam. Well, my question is... Not Islam, Ishmael, not, not the religion. Right. Right, not Islam, just Ishmael. Ishmael, you know, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Oh, well, then that, then that answers so that my answers question. Your question. <laughs> I like you, it. That's great. So, no, no, no. All right. Anyways, well, you, you want so to much. follow up with Whatever, but. Okay. I think we still have a couple callers on hold, so we'll go ahead and check one more. I, I, no, but that's like you, humongous. You want to go with that? Let's let's expand on that. What, 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 does, is he still on? Yes, he, yes. He's still, he's still with us so right now. Did you have a question in that, or? Well, I was just wondering about the parallel between that and Genesis thirty-five twenty-nine, where Jacob and Esau bury their father together as well, and what that means. Okay. Okay, very good. So, go ahead and hang up to it if you answer. Guys, this will be the last call for the day. Thank you all for tuning in. Don't, don't leave us till this thing is finished out. Good deal. Okay, Phil, thank you for calling in, sir. Right. I didn't get the part of the question. Oops. I think that, Sorry. yeah. So, um... With Asov, Asov, I'm really not sure what that end part was, but Asov is the ultimate of an individual who is not integrated. Asov's head was chopped off, and his head was buried in the tomb of the patriarchs. His body didn't make it in. Asov was completely unintegrated. The head, body, separate. The whole point of what we were talking about with the caller before is that they must be integrated. And that's what comes into the view there. The idea is to that your body and your mind should be connected, should be integrated. Asa was up, down, completely separate. Genesis 
25 is about what I've spoken about for many, many years, maybe before the Abraham Accords, for all that stuff. I told you that the B'nai Yishmael, the children of Ishmael, the Arabs, and the Jews, the B'nai Israel, the children of Jacob, that they will have peace. And they will, it, it won't come easy, but it will come. Just like there was tension between Yishmael and his brother Isaac, but ultimately there was resolution. Now, this is not me saying it. I don't give a prophecy. The Talmud discusses the tract above Basra. It's discussed there. And that's what we find. Now, Yishmael ultimately returns to Isaac, and that's a complete resolution. Esav is just a nightmare to the end. And Esav is Edom is ultimately very much dis- very much destroyed. In fact, we have whole books in the Bible devoted to just describing the, the destruction of Edom, Esav. Thank you for your question. All right, Rabbi, I guess that's going to wrap us up for today. So thank you all once again for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, turn on notifications, and uh, yeah, and we'll look we'll forward to seeing you same, maybe not same time. We'll go back to the normal, regular scheduled time next week, Hashem willing. And so you hope you all have a wonderful week. And uh, also, Rabbi, can I mention uh, real briefly um, uh, the, the link you provided for uh, for what's going on with uh, Lepi Stutch? Yeah, please do. Okay, cool. So, all right. All right uh, so, you guys are, are aware that there is uh, there's some litigation going on right now between uh, with Rabbi and the last video we put up exposing uh, some information uh, with the Prime Minister's uh, family situation. So, uh, there is on um, if you'll. In fact, I'm gonna see if I can just play it here real fast or send you a link. Um, if you want to donate to help Rabbi with this for all, because this is getting kind of costly, all these uh, uh, the lawyers and stuff. So, you could just go to PayPal and look up t- the Tovia Singer one at AOL.com. Rabbi, is there another way that they can go to contribute to and this? If you go to outreachjudaism.org. Yes, there we go. Yeah, and then you go to support us. Um, I, I hope you'll consider. It's a very serious situation. And I discussed this in my recent videos on my channel, Toby Singer. Right. And if you would see it to support, I'm gonna drag us this now. over. I'm gonna drag this over oh. here so everybody yeah, can see. Very good. Okay, I'm just putting this over your screen lay so that people could see where it's at. So basically, you're gonna go. This is Outreach DM's website. Just go to. Uh, there's the home and the support our work. Just click on that. And then it will take you to um, an, another page that actually has the video, which will explain everything that's going on. So all your support there is, will be greatly appreciated for sure. And um, Hashem bless all of you for, for tuning in and supporting this work as well. So y'all have a great week, and we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Shalom, my dear friends. Hope this message finds you well. If you like the way this channel is going and the channel has been a blessing to you, please consider supporting the channel by going to the website, tanakhtalk.com. T-A-N-A-C-H-T-A-L-K dot com. Thank you once again for your time and for supporting Tanak Talk. Shalom. Thank you.